You need truth and life. Here is the Brother Leon Show. You better recognize. What's going on, listeners? This is your boy, Brother Leon, and we are back again for another episode of the Brother Leon Show. So we are in our series, 91 Psalms for 91 Days. I know it's been a while since we covered a psalm, but today we are definitely going to cover Psalms 39 today. So I'm going to turn over there first, and then we are going to go over into Acts chapter 17. So the word of the Lord that I have for you today is a word of do not fret. Do not fret because the number one thing that I want you guys to know that in this season, God has called us to be one body. Be one body. And that is we are all, we are all one race. Now, granted, for, for context and also social constructs, we identify with the fact that we are black, that we are white. You know, that that we can be red, we can be yellow. We identify ourselves with colors because that's a part of the social construct and that's a part of the world in which we live. And so what you're seeing today is injustice when it comes against black and brown people and people of color. And so, you know, the crazy part is, is that a lot of people are angry because of the movement of Black Lives Matter. And how that thing has just exploded. And the crazy part is, is that it's a wake up call to get the world to see that we are here. Because for too long, black people and people of color have been invisible. You know, I remember one time I went I went down south and, you know, the crazy part is, is that sometimes when you are in a certain place. And this is the notice that I got from the outside looking in, from being up north and coming down south. The one thing that I saw a lot of times is the fact that when you are down south, sometimes that that racism is so that they will actually treat you invisible. Yeah, they want your money. Yeah, they want your business. But at times, they will treat you invisible and not even give you the level of service that you see white families get. And I mean, we, you know, we were a black family going out for dinner and it's crazy. It's like, and then when one of the people in our group pointed it out to our server, it was just like, all right, whatever. I mean, just totally invisible. And I, and I said to the person I was with at the time, I was like, yo, why, why are they treating us like we invisible? I said that. But, you know, the thing is, is that sometimes when you are in a climate for so long, you become oblivious to the conditions until somebody gets irritated. And so that is where we are at right now. We have lived with this systemic racism for so long that people have become oblivious to it to a certain degree. I'm not going to lie. I can appreciate those who are overt overt with their racism. Those who who pretty much, yo, this is how I am. This is who, uh, what I say. This is what I believe. I appreciate that because at least I know. But the one that gets me the most is that covert racism. And I've said it before because it acts like it's trying to help when it actually hurts. And this is the issue that I have with the church, the white church in particular, because they were silent on lynchings. They were silent. And the crazy part is that when you look at the history of slavery, it was authorized by the church. And I told you guys that the first conduit into the earth is the church. The second conduit is the White House. And so whatever the church authorizes and allows The pass through its doors, it goes into the body, it goes into the community, just like the White House. Just like the White House authorized and let loose birth of a nation. And so that movie was allowed to play and and, and the, and the fanfare 
if I can say, the fanfare and the excitement of that movie was so that people called it a religious experience and that thing went throughout the nation empowering the spirit of racism. And I get the argument that people say that this thing is not going to go nowhere. And they say the reason it is not going to go nowhere is because it is sin. And as long as there is sin in the world, you're going to have to deal with this. I get it. But the Bible says that we are not of this world. And I'm not trying to say that we are exempt from it. No, you will never be exempt. I don't care how spiritual you are. But I say this to the church. Does the church still have to have the sin of racism in it? And I say no. Because if we are separate, if we are one body, if we are one blood, if we are one people, then how is it that we can have this thing in our houses of God? Because like I said, man, God is not coming back for a church like this. And we are going to have to deal with it because as much as we are looking for the excitement of Christ's return, he ain't going to come back for a bride that is like this. He ain't going to come back for a twisted bride looking this sloppy. That's the God knows truth. And yes, I said it. Because we have got to get to the place where we have decolonized our faith, where there is no respect or a person is in our faith. Because that's what it is. We have brought into this whole thing and, and the spirit of racism has even twisted our theology and our personal convictions. And that was the motivation behind Fred Price. Because if you look at the fact of we as word of faith people are fathers in the faith. Smith Wigglesworth all the way down. All of those fathers were white. And then the issue came up of segregation and racism and personal prejudice came up in one of the fathers of faith. Kenneth Hagin Jr. So you have to ask yourself, if that issue was brought up and it was brought to Fred Price's attention and he dealt with it, where did Kenneth Hagin Jr. get it from? Because I'm going to tell you like I told you before, nobody, no gift is exempt from racism. It is something that has to be dealt with in the mind and in the heart. And like I've said, black people and people of color cannot be racist. They can be prejudiced. And you got to understand the complexities because when you look at racism, there is a power structure behind it. Black people and people of color have never had it. I will give you one example. Who have black people or people of color ever stopped from voting? And I'm going to just go with that one. But you got to understand and know the time that we live. I understand the argument, the other side of the argument. But why do we have to put up with it in church? Why do we have to put up with the silence? Why do we have to now turn it around and call that which is evil good and call that which is good evil? Speaking about the protests and Black Lives Matter. But now, you know, we have some white pastors and leaders that are talking. Look at the blessing that slavery brought to our nation. And let's not call it white privilege. Let's call it white blessing. And the crazy thing is, is that if that is the attitude, if that is your truth, then we have a problem that is deeper than we can imagine. I love the fact that pa Pastor Robert Morris, I believe of Gateway Church in Texas, has talked about, about, about racism. And I looked at a little clip. I love the fact that he is challenging his people. So the one thing I will say, I applaud those, those white uh, pastors or white Christian brothers who are now challenging those in the white community to begin to see from the black perspective and, and to begin to ask questions because we need to have questions. We need to have dialogue. But I still believe it is not safe for a black person to be under white pastorage. Not right now. Not in this day and age, especially when it comes to, to, to the issues 
of black people and let's first start with economics and, and I'm not one to try to say you know we need to 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 keep it that way no we need to keep it that way until things become equal until our dollar begins to circulate 31 days before it goes out of our community because you got to look at the numbers that are involved and I told you guys when you take spirituality out of the church it is about numbers it is about money it is about sustainability. And that's the God knows truth. So you have to see it for what it really is. And that's the God knows truth. So let's go over here to Psalms 39. And as I pull it up on my Bible app, I want you guys to understand and know where I am. Yeah, okay. Psalms 39. I'm going to go with verse 1. I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. So what that means is basically I'm going to make sure that I don't give my enemies bullets to shoot me with. I'm going to make sure that even in the workplace... As everything is in a knot and even in tension, I'm going to keep my words because I'm going to tell you, man, you have to watch. If you're a black person, a person of color, people are going to want to have certain conversations with you. You got to watch what you listen to when you're at work and you don't have no headphones. You even have to watch what you are reading. And it's a shame that I have to say this, but I have to say it nonetheless. Because people would, would, would say, hey, he's starting trouble. He's a race baiter. He, you know, he's, um, you know, reverse racism. And, and I feel offended. I, I don't feel comfortable, you know, hearing some of these things. And the crazy part about it is that I remember a while back when I was working at my job that somebody I was I was temporary supervisor. And somebody got offended at the fact that I was listening to religious messages in my office get it in my office and they were outside in the lunchroom and could hear little segments of it but normally you know the radio was going so they got their thing going I got my thing going it shouldn't be no problem but I end up getting emails from the supervisor talking about hey I hear you're playing um, Louis Farrakhan and some of the people feel uncomfortable with you listening to that and get it I wasn't even listening to Louis Farrakhan I was listening to Bishop Noel Jones and so my response was how is it that they are paying attention to what I do in, in my office and not even paying attention to the work that they have to do that's what I said you know and then and then I, and then the reply was if you're going to listen to stuff like that listen to it in your car so this is what I mean when I say watch your back black people and people of color because the crazy part about it is that you got to begin to be to have choice in your battles. You have to ask yourself, you know, you know, do I take this battle? Is it something that 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 I will be able to do or will I end up losing the whole war? And these are the things that you have to look at, because at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you, man, it's not worth giving somebody ammunition to shoot you with. So you got to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove so i want to take you over to acts chapter 17 because the one thing that you have to realize like i said earlier is that we are one people we are one body but the thing that gets me is that do we have to put up with racism in the church and i say no we do not and I also say that that conversation needs to be had. If you're going to call it sin, call it sin. Call it what needs to be called racism. Rach, racial and color prejudice. Call it that. Also call it white privilege, white fragility, white denial, white rage. Because some people will have you think that you know, 
I'm not a Klansman. But yet when it comes to issues of equality and fairness, that, you know, all of a sudden now, you know, this, this, this thing of racism comes up. You know, when we start looking at equality, when we start looking at leveling the playing field, people didn't get mad at Martin Luther King until he started talking about leveling the playing field. When it came to money, when it came to, to real estate, when it came to health, you know, and everybody is okay until, you know, a black person visits their world. And what I mean by that is you don't know how racist you are. You don't know if you suffer from it until a black person enters your world. And what I mean by that is, okay, here it is. You teaching your sons and everything to be good people. But all of a sudden out the blue, he brings home a black girl and says, I want to get married. And all of a sudden you're looking at him and looking at her all crazy. Like, yo, what is this? I was not ready for this. And then you have to ask yourself, do I suffer from racism? Or here it is. You have a white daughter and she brings home a black man. Or she even brings home a Hispanic man. And then you have to ask yourself, am I ready for this? Because now you're looking at him all crazy. And you have to ask yourself, okay, Lord, do I, do I suffer from the sin of racism? Is racism in my heart? Because if so, I need to be delivered. As much as I preach Christ, would I be okay with my daughter or my son marrying a person that is not white? Would I be okay with that? And these are the questions that need to be answered. Because I'll, I'll give you an example. Look at the opioid crisis and compare it, <clears throat> excuse me, to the crack e epidemic. Because if you look at both plagues on society when it came to addiction, crack hit the black community unrelentlessly. It hit them with, I mean, oh my God, it hit them hard. And that's the God knows truth. And if you look at the laws that were enacted, the laws that were enacted is that you had more time for crack possession and selling than you, than you had for powder cocaine selling and using and distributing. And the crazy part about it, the only thing that, that is the, the, that makes crack different from cocaine is water and baking soda. I'm serious. That's the only thing. But but powder cocaine is more white and crack cocaine is more black. And so the laws were enacted to basically persecute and put black men in jail for longer periods of time than white men who sold cocaine. And so when you see this, you have to ask yourself, is this right? Is this fair? Because black people were made to rehab in jail. They were doing rehab in jail behind bars. But yet when it came to the opioid crisis, we have to find funding. We have to find rehab. We have to find something because now this is a plague to our community. So my question is this again. It doesn't become a problem until a black person enters your world or a black problem enters into your world. And, 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 and the problem of addiction entered into white suburbia. The same type of problem that hit the black community. But yet you do not see laws Oh my God, you don't even see the same laws for opioid distribution and selling that you saw for cocaine. I mean, crack, crack possession. You don't see that. And this is what I mean when, when you look at the war on drugs, it was actually a war on black people. Go look up the history. War on crime, war on black people. But this is what I mean when I say that the church is the first conduit. 
And if we're going to talk about righteousness, if we're going to talk about unity and oneness and reconciliation and being on one accord, we have to begin to deal with the issue of sin. God can redeem the time. I believe that. But you have to talk about the time that needs to be redeemed. The time of slavery, the time even before the slave ships. Because the one thing you got to realize is that Christianity was taken out of Africa, just like the African slave. But you also have to teach of the brilliance of the people of Africa. Because, hey, the Bible says out of Egypt have I called my son. And you got to look at the genealogy. And I'm not going to and I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Looking at the genealogy does not do anything. To take you to heaven You have to have faith You have to be, be born again and be saved And have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior No man cometh unto the Father But by me But I'm here to tell you Is that we have to get this image Of white Jesus That was used during slavery times Out of our churches Because if we do not Then we are actually saying That God is a respecter of persons and it gives us the notion that we can be that way and we can keep a, a spirit of superiority and always project inferiority among those who do not look like us or believe like us. So I'm here to tell you today that judgment must first begin out the at the house of God. And the Bible says that if we would judge ourselves, if the church would judge itself, then it would not be judged. So. Let's go over here to Acts. Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to go down to verse. Let's see. Here we are. Twenty-four. Acts 17 and 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined that the times before appointed. And the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And I'm going to stop right there. So you have to understand and know that God has called us to unity, that God has called us one. Because we're made out of dust. The only thing that really that really gives us distinction is the fact that we have melanin in our skin. And that some of us have moved to different regions of the earth. So this whole notion about one person being superior than another. No, it is not that way. Now, granted, everybody might be skilled different. But that does not make a person less than or better than. Because all of us have given, have, 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 have a degree of knowledge. God has dealt to every man a level of faith. And we have knowledge. Every, every being has knowledge. And you can see the brilliance in each ethnicity. You can see it in the black. You can see it in the white. You can see it. In the Hispanic, you can see it in the Asian. You can see it in the Native American. You can see it in the Aborigines. You can see it in the Africans. You can see our brilliance. And this is what I mean about God giving this to us. And so we as the church, we have to begin to celebrate difference. But we also have to minister deliverance to the body. Because I'm going to tell you right now, in order for us to come into real revival, there needs to have deliverance. The body needs deliverance. The body needs a renewing of the mind. 
The body needs to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Because I'm going to tell you, as long as we keep the label, we will not see each other's humanity. That's the God knows truth. And that's the only that's the only way this thing's going to be turned around, because in order to come into reconciliation, real reconciliation, you have to be equal. You have to see things as equal. And when a white race, when the white race has never seen black people as equal, when you look at the history, how can reconciliation come when you feel as though that you are better than and, 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 and they don't even measure up? That is the history that we live in. Even some of the laws that were enacted to try to level the playing field, white people fought against. They definitely fought against affirmative action. There was pushback against the 64 Civil Rights Bill, the 68 Civil Rights Bill. There's pushback even right now on some of these bills being enacted to try to curb police violence and murder. And you're seeing the pushback now. So I'm here to tell you that we have got to first change it in the church. It has to be a conversation. And we have to have it from those religious leaders who have great influence and great platforms. It just can't be the black preacher. The black preacher can't tell you the whole sum of revelation on how to turn this thing around. There needs to be white pastors and leaders who need to do this thing. But they got to recognize it. But the one thing I'll tell you is this, is that the church has been complacent. The white church evangelicals have been complacent and quiet when it came to issues in the black community. And yes, I said it. And it's a shame that that it's like that because there are those who are more interested in saving the black soul than saving the black body. And you have to look at the fact when you see it. No pushback on Tamir Rice being killed as a 12 year old. You got to look at the way they see us. But yet we fight for abortion. We fight against abortion. You know, we, we are very vocal when it comes to issues of abortion. But yet this boy was aborted outside the womb. But I'm here to tell you guys that we cannot remain silent and we as the church we as black people I'm going to tell you you cannot afford to allow racism to use you or to even set you up because there are those men who want to sabotage the conversation there are those who want to sabotage the work that's being done right now and so you have to ask yourself which side am I going to be on because you're going to end up having to choose a side are you going to be on the side of being vocal against it or are you going to be on the side of being silent and I know there's a, there's a third option you can be okay well look <laughs> I don't want to see black people get nothing you could be that as well that's the third option but I haven't even put that in there Either you're going to be silent or you're going to be vocal. And like I told you, it gives you clarity on whatever side you want. It will give you clarity. So I'm here to tell you right now, you've got to get to the place where it's like, okay, I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to allow myself to be used. I'm not going to allow myself to be silent. I'm not going to allow, you know, what God has given me. I'm not going to allow my freedom to become a stumbling block to my brother. I'm going to speak up on his behalf. And I'm not going to lie. Some people are going to be angry. They're going to feel like that you have betrayed them. Because some people, they're, they're going to stand for agenda. And I get that. You know, I totally get it. Because I look at it like this. You know, it's one side and then there's the side of me. <laughs> I'm on my side. I'm on I'm on my side. I'm for my my progression, my growth, my this, my that. It's about you. You know, your life is like a Drake song, all me. But I'm telling you, listener, get to the place where you allow God 
to mold you and shape you and know that we cannot have this in the house of God because God is not going to come back for a bride that is twisted up like this. So on that note, Lister, I want you to be blessed. I want you to know that there is a side. And I also want you to know that you can get to the place where God, he can set you up for blessing. And he can set you up for a place of blessing where nobody can touch you. But you got to be willing to walk with him. You got to be willing to, to acknowledge, Lord, I trust you. And I'm willing to stand with my brothers. I'm willing to stand on the side of right. I'm willing to stand and not allow myself to be silent because I've been so used to the condition in the atmosphere. But I know the condition in the atmosphere was not conducive for my black brothers and sisters growth. They had to put up with it, but it wasn't fair. And so now you're going to have to find yourself in a place of not fretting. And not, and not allowing your mouth to curse Because with our mouths We bless and we curse not Now granted Brother Leon you will hear him cuss But Brother Leon will not curse And there's a difference I'm not going to pronounce death over you I'm not going to pronounce dryness Over your finances over you Now granted I may cuss a little bit To try to wake you up To get you to see some stuff Because I'm that passionate But I'm not here to curse you I'm here to bless you you got to realize that this is the time that you are needed. So on that note, listen, I want you to be blessed. Have faith and don't be stupid because I'm going to tell you, man, this coronavirus has not gone anywhere. And they're opening things and some things are closing back up. So you are going to have to have discernment. Discernment, I'm telling you. You're going to have to have discernment because people, man, they have gotten excited because of these openings, because of these protests and people are going outside without masks. People are just ignoring the whole social distance things. And some people have never shut down churches. They have never shut down church since this whole thing has started. And they ain't going to tell you whether or not they have had it or not. They ain't going to tell you that. So I want you guys to be aware and to keep your family safe. Because I'll tell you this. You can be in faith and still wear a mask. You can be in faith and still do those things to protect your family. Because the Bible says that I will show you my faith by my works. It's nothing wrong with you ministering in the preventive. Because preparation is not lost time. You have to understand and know that. So with that being said, I want you guys to be blessed, have a blessed day. And like I said again, I'm going to say it again. Have faith, but don't be stupid. Peace. Walk in the truth that makes you free every day. Follow Brother Leon on all social media outlets.